The next few moments are devoted to silent prayer. That gives each of you as a believer priest the privacy of your priesthood to rebound if necessary. For if we name our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to purify us from all wrongdoing. When we name our sins to God, he is faithful, well, uh, we are filled with God the Holy Spirit. God the Holy Spirit is our mentor and our teacher and the one who brings to our memory those things we have forgotten. So with that in mind, let us pray. Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and freedom to assemble ourselves together for the purpose of learning your word. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us and may we have the concentration necessary to assimilate this portion of the word of God into our stream of consciousness. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. I have in my hand the 13 Steps to Insecurity. This was composed by Colonel R.B. Thiem Jr. in the 1990s, I believe the early 90s, or mid-90s, somewhere in there. The 13 Steps of Insecurity. Number one, insecure husbands result in insecure wives. Number two, insecure parents result in insecure children. Number three, insecure children result in an insecure generation. Number four, an insecure generation demands security. Number five, in demanding security from government, an insecure generation becomes an entitled generation. Principle 5 describes my generation. Number 6. The entitlement is offered to the insecure generation by insecure politicians who want to be reelected. Insecure people elect insecure politicians. Number 6. I believe, or is it seven? One, two, three, four, five, six. Number seven. The vehicle for entitlement becomes some form of socialism offered by an insecure government, divorced from the establishment principles, as found in the infallible Word of God. And we've discussed this in terms of how everything that's going on in this country is the reverse of what God intended for the divine institutions. Volition? Volition is something that Satan says, no, that is not the issue. And the reason why is because it's Satan's own volition that resulted in his sentence to the lake of fire of which he appealed and now we are living out the angelic conflict. So Satan definitely doesn't like the idea of an institution of volition. So what he does is say, volition hasn't caused anything to go wrong in your life. What has caused things to go wrong in your life is environment, for it is environment that has controlled your decisions. This is deceptive and false. Well, that's the same thing. It's deceptive and it's not based in reality, for we can see that whether rich or poor, people make bad decisions and destroy their lives. Environment has nothing to do with it. Number eight, to finance this pseudo-security of socialism, an insecure government buys power and security for itself through both confiscation of wealth and unjust taxation and redistribution of wealth in the name of the greatest good for the greatest number. So we have the fact of unjust taxation. Unjust taxation would be any form of progressive income tax. Why take more from one segment of society and take less from another segment of society? In fact, under the flat tax system, you do take more from the top and you take less from the bottom by percentage-wise. 10% of 100 is 
ten percent of a million is a hundred thousand. So you see the rich are always paying more in tax even under a flat tax system. Now it's true they have nine hundred thousand left over but that's theirs. That's what they earned. And it's not fair to take away ninety one percent of what they earned. That's theft. That means that if they made a hundred thousand or a million they would have to pay nine hundred and ten thousand dollars in taxes and have left over ninety thousand that stifles an economy and it keeps people from wanting to work so hard that after their hard work they're left with ninety thousand when they should have been left with nine hundred thousand that's a tragedy that's what socialism does and it enslaves a people and destroys their economy for without rich people there is no rich country so to finance this pseudo security number eight again of socialism an insecure government buys power and security for itself through both confiscation of wealth and unjust taxation and redistribution of wealth in the name of the greatest good for the greatest number. Number nine, in the process of socialism, giving pseudo security to the insecure, human freedom is destroyed and replaced by false promises of blessing plus the tricky words of demagoguery like change. And this was written in the 1990s. You might notice the two words we've been studying, hope and change. Well, people have a short memory. We often associate Barack Hussein Obama as the author of the words hope and change and the only politician who's ever come up with such an idea. No, it was Bill Clinton. He was the first. Well, not even the first, but one of many of the politicians who used hope and change as a way to win votes. And they are simply tricky words of demagoguery because what does change mean? Change from what to what? Well, we're starting to find out. A change from capitalism to socialism to put hope in the government instead of self-reliance. Number 10 the biblical principle of freedom and the laws of divine establishment are superseded by absolute power in the hands of the insecure and incompetent rulers whose power lust feeds on the demands of the people of something for nothing the demands of the people of something for nothing excuse me so that people will sell their heritage of freedom for a mess of pottage. We studied that last night under the concept of he Esau in Hebrews. Esau so sold his inheritance for a mess of pottage. And it comes out in Hebrews that he also rejected Christ. So he rejected spiritual freedom as well for a mess of pottage of whatever he had in life. And it turns out that even though he sold his inheritance, Esau became a very wealthy man as an unbeliever. But that doesn't mean anything anymore. He left all that wealth behind. At the time of his death, he went into the compartment of Hades. So people have sold their heritage of freedom for a mess of pottage. That's happened here in the United States. After I went over the Ten Amendments, you could see very clearly that we follow almost none of them. And those amendments were put into place as a protection of our freedom. And they listed only ten. And they said this is not to be construed as taking away other rights that should be reserved for the state and for the people. Other rights such as I believe it was Texas that was last to 
say you had to wear a seat belt. It was Texas that was last in caving to the federal government in order to stop passenger side uh, people from being able to drink alcohol in a vehicle as long as the driver was not partaking. And you say, well, that's a good bill. You say, that's part of human good. Well, it's something Texas didn't want to do, but they were forced to do. And that's a violation of states' rights, a violation of the Tenth Amendment of the Constitution. A federal speed limit, by the way, which was 55 miles an hour under Jimmy Carter that lasted all the way up until about 1995, well, Richard Nixon. He might as well change his uh, name from Republican to Democrat. Under Richard Nixon, and then I remember saying 55 saves lives. To go 55 miles an hour today, it feels like you're crawling along the street. Now states are regulating their own speed limits. We recently in Ohio decided to go from 65 to 70. Good decision. I always wondered why I had to go 65 until I got to the border of Indiana and then I could go 70. But when you see things like that, then you are seeing states' rights. That all came out of the Newt Gingrich Revolution in 1994 in which Newt Gingrich said there should be no federal speed limit. The state should decide for this is a violation of the Tenth Amendment. And it passed. And so if you want to know why you can go 77 down the highway in a 70, well, it has to do with the fact that we got some states' rights back. Number 11. This is the beginning of national self-destruction, which can only be reversed by the spiritual solution. That's where we've come. The only hope or confidence that we can have in this country is in a spiritual solution. It begins with regeneration by faith alone in Christ alone and continues with post-salvation function of the spiritual skills post-salvation epistemological rehabilitation and attains maximum momentum through a pivot of mature believers through whom God blesses the nation. Without this pivot of mature believers God will not bless the nation. And we may have lost that pivot. We may be down to a remnant chosen according to the few. And that means those few have reached Pleroma to Theu, and we're simply waiting on God to go through the process that he must go through to extend grace as part of his righteousness and justice, and then to simply stamp off on the next cycle of discipline, and stamp off on the next one. And as I said, once the stamp off is made, there will be calamitous situations that will boggle your mind, that I won't even attempt to describe because you wouldn't believe me. So this is the beginning of national self-destruction which can only be reversed by the spiritual solution. And that begins with regeneration by faith in Christ and continues with post-salvation epistemological rehabilitation by which believers attain maximum momentum through to become part of the pivot of mature believers through whom God blesses the nation. Number 12. In the end, the only true and genuine security is provided by the grace of God, never by the efforts of mankind. And this goes for those of you believers who have gotten involved in crusader arrogance, and you think you can turn the world upside down by utilizing the energy of your flesh, by going to an abortion clinic and holding up your stupid signs that have never saved one soul, wouldn't you be better off by holding up a sign with the words of John 3.16? Of course you would. But you would rather go off on your own agenda, not God's agenda, and try to whitewash the devil's world by putting into place a set of morality that is false on the one hand, but a set of morality that 
Satan himself would like to see. Or to get involved in any type of civil disobedience against any type of government, no matter how severe in its tyranny. Many of our forefathers did not understand this principle. They thought that within the United States, if the government were to deteriorate and become part of a system of tyranny, which it already has, then the people then have a right to bear arms against that system. But well, we don't follow that as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. We follow what the Bible has to say. We don't get involved in trying to stop God's divine discipline. And that's what you're doing when you go into crusader arrogance in the energy of the flesh. You are stepping in and trying to make changes by symptom shadow boxing, by boxing at the air. Nothing will happen except things will become worse for you in punishment. You will be punished by authorities. You will be punished by God. And you are not an example of one who is living the unique spiritual life. That's not to say one cannot defend himself, but it is to say that you cannot go on the offensive. For example, if this country were to fall apart and there would be roving bands and gangs taking property, which is very possible, it's only being held back by the grace of God, but if that were to occur, you have every right, if they come upon your property, to shoot them dead. You have a right to your life. And in such cases, that is not civil disobedience. That is self-defense. You have a right to self-defense. Number 12, in the end, the only true and genuine security is provided by the grace of God, never by the efforts of mankind, never by the efforts of going on a crusade, getting involved in crusader arrogance, which is part of Satan's cosmic system. Number 13. Socialism and other forms of political panaceas are tantamount to rejection of the divine solution. God's answer to insecurity is provided in two categories. We have the laws of divine establishment, and then the ultimate solution for time and eternity, entrance into the protocol plan of God by faith alone in Christ alone, and then by fulfilling the protocol plan of God by utilizing your spiritual skills. What are your spiritual skills? Do you remember the three spiritual skills? The three spiritual skills involve the power of the filling of God the Holy Spirit plus the power of Operation Z which simply means the transfer of academic knowledge, Gnosis, into beyond knowledge, Epinosis, and then is available on the thought line of your soul to become part of a defense line. We are always in defense when it comes to Satan as the ruler of this world. And number three is the utilization of the ten problem-solving devices, of which we don't know all at once, but we learn over time. And if you go through the Essential Series, you will note that I name each one and explain in detail the ten problem-solving devices. Number one, rebound, the utilization of 1 John 1.9. If we name our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to purify us from all wrongdoing. Number two, the filling of God the Holy Spirit. In order to maintain the filling of God the Holy Spirit, you resist temptation and you remain in fellowship. If you fall out of fellowship, you should immediately refer back to the first rebound and get right back into fellowship. And if the more you rebound, means the more you recognize the concept of hermardiology and all the sins involved and the more you maintain the filling of God the Holy Spirit 
Number three, the faith rest drill in four categories. The first category simply being mixing the promises of God with faith. And you may have read a promise such as cast all your cares on him for he cares for you, which is quoted twice in the Bible. And you uh, go ahead and claim that promise, mix it with faith, and then you are able to move on in life without that destructive part of the cosmic system called worry. From there you can move on after executing the four stages of the faith rest drill to grace orientation. At that point you make Christianity attractive to those in your periphery. But again you must grow in the grace and in the knowledge of your Lord and Savior. Grace comes first for a reason and they work in tandem and then doctrine. The reason why is you must have grace in mind the more and more you learn Bible doctrine. Otherwise you'll try to take whatever doctrine you've learned and shove it down the throats of people who don't want it and that's not your business. That's not even my business. People who don't want it, I don't really want them to listen, but sometimes it happens. Actually, oftentimes it happens. And woe to the pastor who has a negative congregation and then has to teach them Bible doctrine. I've been there. To which the majority was negative. It's not pleasant, but a teaching tool nonetheless. The best type of congregation is to have them positive toward the word and to look at as few of them as possible. But of course if it's God's will for you to have more sheep he'll bring them. You'll just have to deal with that with your own spiritual life. So number 13 again socialism and other, well I will, I'll go ahead and give you the 10. Uh, grace and doctrinal orientation, grace must come first, otherwise you'll become legalistic and try to shove every point of doctrine you've learned down everyone else's throat instead of using that doctrine yourself. Then after doctrinal orientation, you break through the door of confidence. And as a result, you acquire a confidence that is called having a personal sense of destiny. You know why you're here, you know why God placed you here, and every believer should be able to come up with a resounding one answer. I am here to fulfill the protocol plan of God. I am here to execute the plan of God, to go through post-salvation epistemological rehabilitation, and to execute God's plan for my life, and eventually to become a Pleroma believer having all the fullness of blessing from God. That is your personal sense of destiny. For the pastor teacher, your personal sense of destiny is to teach the Word of God on a daily, consistent basis, impart it to your congregation, and make sure you stay straight with doctrine and give doctrine straightly to your congregation. Number seven impersonal love for all mankind. It works in tandem with number eight. Actually number seven is personal love for God the Father. That comes first. Which works, that's the motivation, which works in tandem with impersonal love for all mankind. These two work in tandem. For your personal love for God is the motivator. And you love God so much that you can respond to God instead of reacting to people. And since you're not reacting to people but responding to God, impersonal love just about falls in your lap and you are able to handle and love people at a distance as it were. Even if you're in close proximity to them, you can love them at a distance in your thinking. That's what it means. To love someone at a distance in your thinking in that you love them not based on who and what they are, they may be trouble, but you love them based upon who and what you are, and you by this point should be filled with integrity. 
So you have those two that work in tandem, personal love for God and impersonal love for all mankind. Those working in tandem could also be categorized as sharing the love of God. For he works with us on the same basis except in reciprocity. In other words, God loves us with a perfect love because each believer has the righteousness of God. God loves no believer better than another. God does not love the believer who even executes the protocol plan of God more than the believer who is a failure. Why? Because the believer who is a failure has the same righteousness that the believer who is a winner will have the same righteousness. So what's the point of executing the protocol plan of God? It is not to gain God's love or to make it grow towards you because God's love does not grow as human love grows. God's love is a constant. It's for your benefit to live the spiritual life for that is where your blessings come from. And if you are functioning outside of fellowship in carnality and you never rebound, you will receive God's love through divine discipline. For whom, the God, for whom God loves, he chastens and skins alive with a whip every son whom he receives. If one does not receive discipline, then he is an illegitimate child. And on the other hand, if you execute the protocol plan of God, you will go through various stages of testing. The various stages of testing include hardship that you can handle. The various stages of divine discipline include discipline that you cannot handle or is unbearable. So you take your choice. Do you want unbearable punishment from the love of God? Or do you want bearable discipline or bearable testing bearable testing that will result in glory in the end and at the Bema when it comes to living your life in the light of eternity the Bema being the evaluation throne of Christ immediately following the resurrection you will not be ashamed at Christ's coming and you will receive reward one city two cities, ten cities during the millennial reign of our Lord Jesus Christ while others will most will walk around with nothing in their basically naked resurrection body. Don't take that literally but it's simply a resurrection body with no decoration no rewards but you're there you'll be happy to be there but you will experience shame at the judgment seat or the evaluation throne better translated when you meet the Lord in the air and shortly thereafter actually it's at the time you meet the Lord in the air because the Bible asks you will you be ashamed at his coming this is something you can ask yourself in privacy right now don't shake your head yes or no play poker and simply think about it to yourself if the Lord Jesus Christ were to come tonight would you be ashamed of yourself then you have all eternity to walk down the hall of records and see all that you had in your inheritance for eternity locked up in a hall of records You've depo it's, been on, it's on deposit for you but the requirement for withdrawal is to reach maturity. We have certain functions like that in human life in which we will give our child money or put it in a savings account and it may grow to as much as a hundred thousand depending upon how much you put in there. And then upon them becoming adults whatever you set up 18 or 21 when you set that up, you are saying to them, you have on deposit 
money. But you won't receive it until a certain time. And when they reach that certain time, then they receive that money on deposit to do with whatever they wish. At least that would be the grace way. I'm sure some people would like to write letters and say, now, don't do this with your money. Don't go buy a hot rod. Rather, put a down payment on a home or buy a small home outright or do something smart with your money. They might not want to do something smart with their money. They might not be smart. And in most occasions at that age, they're not going to be. And whatever you write, they're not going to listen to anyway. So don't go out that way. Always be gracious when giving. No strings attached. They'll make their decision. And if they lose out on their inheritance, that's freedom. If they turn that inheritance into a billion dollars, that's freedom. Don't think, don't think like a tyrant. Don't think like the federal government that, which tries to tell us what to do with our money. Nobody's business what you do with your own money. Period. Over and out. That's the concept of live and let live. But even in our human standards, we have this idea of putting an inheritance on hold or on reserve. We have an inheritance on reserve. Every blessing that is available to us is on reserve, with your name on it. If you're a pastor, no matter how terrible you are, and no matter how great you are in giving the message out of Bible doctrine, you right now have on deposit your crown of righteousness. Whether you receive that crown of righteousness demands whether in the interim you fulfill the mandates of that deposit that is held in escrow. For example, you hold in escrow money for your son or grandson or granddaughter or daughter. And then you place the stipulation they will not receive it until they turn 21. If they never reach 21, they never receive that money. On deposit for you as a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ is every blessing and reward imaginable. And for the pastor, that includes the crown of righteousness. But there are things to be fulfilled. If you do not grow to spiritual maturity, you won't receive them. And for the pastor, if he does not study and teach and study and teach and study and teach and make sure that he is properly tending his flock, he will not receive the crown of righteousness. So it's an easy way to understand. So the 13th point again, socialism and other forms of political panaceas are tantamount to rejection of the divine solution. God's answer to insecurity is provided in two categories, the laws of divine establishment and the ultimate solution for time and eternity, entrance into the protocol plan of God by faith in Christ and fulfilling the protocol plan of God post-salvation epistemological rehabilitation through the utilization of the three spiritual skills or skills. So, in this description that I've given you, of what will occur at the evaluation throne and what will happen that is not necessarily meant for you to be a motivation to get with the spiritual life because that won't motivate you very long your motivation must be pure and that motivation comes from your love for God and if you have true love for God God loved us first, in reciprocity we can respond. And if you have this true love for God, you will be rightly motivated 
to execute the protocol plan of God out of love, a responsive love toward God. As a result, this proper motivation plus the filling being filled with the Spirit which produces good of intrinsic value, all of this will be evaluated at the evaluation throne immediately at the resurrection and the shame by the way will begin immediately at the resurrection if you failed because you'll know it immediately because it says in scripture are you one to be ashamed at his coming and once again you can ask yourself if the Lord comes tonight in all of his glory now am I going to be ashamed of all the wasted days Am I going to be ashamed because I did not learn the Word of God and have post-salvation, epistemological rehabilitation? One thing I know that won't happen is that not one of our sins will be mentioned at this evaluation. Why? God took care of our sins and the sins of the unbeliever at the cross. So just as at the last judgment, when unbelievers are evaluated on the basis of their righteousness, which is minus R, their righteousness does not reach the righteousness of God, they'll be evaluated on that basis, and on that basis they will be sent to hell because they did not believe in the, uni in the uniquely born Son of God. But their sins will not be brought up. Why? They were all judged at the cross. And for us as believers, our sins will not be brought up. Why? They were judged at the cross. There will be one fundamental question. Did you execute the protocol plan of God or did you not? And you're going to be shocked by the people you see who didn't sin like you sinned who may have gotten involved in sins that you consider gross and may be gross but it won't be brought up. What will be brought up is how far did you go in the spiritual life? Or did you spend so much time trying to be a judge yourself? The answer is I spent a lot of time trying to be a judge myself. You will be ashamed because that hindered you from executing the protocol plan of God. Don't turn in your eternal inheritance for a mess of pottage today. And that mess of pottage could be anything. For a pastor teacher who's going through hard times financially, he may be tempted to water down the word of God or even go into cosmic thinking of public motivational speaking in order to maintain a congregation or widen his congregation and include negative believers so that he might receive an income. Or the pastor may have income and simply would like to see more faces because in society among human viewpoint, human viewpoint says if you don't have a large church as a pastor you are not a success. If you have a small church you're a failure. That's based on human standards. Most of the churches that were formed in the early church were formed in homes which means they were very small in nature though oftentimes scattered around not only Israel but scattered around the entirety of at least the Eastern Roman Empire and their means of non-face-to-face -face communication would be by letter, which was written on parchment or animal skin. Our function with the technology we have would be either through internet, CDs, MP3s, videos, television, and whatnot. Since the internet is less costly, I disseminate my messages through the internet. And it goes across this country and around the world. 
I can look up the IP numbers and it will tell me from which country this IP number is from. Don't worry, I don't know your address, who you are, what your name is. Wouldn't want to know. But I can know from where, not by state, but by country, where people are listening. Most of whom listen in the United States. That's still a good sign for us. I have some from France, England, I've had some from Russia, the Russian Federation, I've had some from China. There are a lot of codes they can't read, but I've definitely had some from India because I received a letter or an email from India and uh, in order for him to write on the form he had to come onto my site, but I never saw India there. It was one of those IP addresses not recognizable. But I guess it could recognize all of the Western, and including Russia, all of the Western and China, and the Western countries' IP addresses, while it could not recognize many others for whatever reason. So, <clears throat> what I'm telling you is, are you going to exchange your spiritual freedom for a mess of pottage? That's the choice you have to make. Now, we can't lose focus on how it started. I've gotten into the minutia of what is human freedom. I've gotten into detail concerning the client nation. I've gotten into detail concerning the four divine institutions and, have we, and how we failed on each four. We've gone into other areas of studying freedom, such as privacy. But we can't lose sight of where we started. And I'm going to continue with the freedom series for a bit longer. But just for a quick overview and a reminder, we're starting from the fact that God created freedom and God in eternity past at one point decided to create angels. For what purpose? To display his perfect righteousness, his perfect justice, and his perfect love. And he gave these angels freedom. So God invented freedom. God loves freedom. God did not create robots. You are not a robot. The angels are not robots. He created them with freedom. And apparently, as it says in the Bible, that Satan was a murderer from the beginning, it didn't take very long at all for Satan to immediately have the attitude of anti-God. He was so beautiful as being the most beautiful creature created from the hand of God. And he had a voice of a pipe organ that it didn't take him long immediately after his creation to say, I will make myself the most high God because he fell under a sin of pride and he chose to do these things and then with his great beauty and his great voice he was able to convince a third of the angels who were right there with God to fall and to say I side with Satan two-thirds of the angels side with man this percentage or this fraction will come up again during the millennium, when Jesus Christ, God, will be right here on the earth with human beings. And at the end of the millennium, when the Gog and Magog revolution ensues, a third of mankind will go with Satan, two-thirds of mankind will go with God, and so it will be finally be settled that the issue is volition, not environment, not even your mental capacity 
because the mental capacity of humans is far less than the mental capacity of the angels. Our physical capacity is far less than the physical, we'll call it physical, physical capacity of the angels. The angels can move at light years speed or beyond light years speed, of course. Way beyond light years speed. Which indicates that they're made up of light, but it's a different type of light. It's a translucent light that can go faster than the speed of light, so it's definitely a different type of light. But we can describe it as angels being made up of light, but it's not the same light that we know from our own universe, because that light, in contrast, travels at a slow speed. Angels can travel faster than a light year. Humans will never get to that point. They make sci-fi shows on it in which they go back in the future by traveling faster than a light year, but that's not even what would happen. They would simply travel faster than a light year. And angels travel faster than light years all the time, traveling to and from heaven and back to earth. Satan is one of the most frequent visitors of heaven because he's always got to make an accusation against a mature believer. He's always got to develop a malice toward a mature believer and as a result he will bring up the sins of a mature believer to Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ will say the same thing every time. I have dealt with that sin on the cross. He is pardoned. But then if you go to evidence testing he won't bring up the sins during evidence testing. What he will do is go into heaven and he will say, Look, I see this man on the earth, Job. And Job, all his days, serves you. I say to you, if you take away his wealth, environment see, that's how Satan thinks, if you take away his children, if you take away his health and wealth, he will curse you, but he didn't. So Job passed the evidence test. But Satan is an accuser. Just as any defense attorney, which is what he is, an attorney, and the defense attorney, the defense attorney will take the witnesses of the prosecution, which would be you and me, and he runs us through the ringers. He brings up our sins. He gossips to God about our sins. Satan's a bit smarter than we are because people gossip to another inconsequential person. That's why if I'm gossiped about, people wonder, how come you don't take it so seriously that someone will think this and this about you? because they're just people. They're sinners themselves. And I don't care about their opinion. How's that for you? I care about God's opinion. So, Satan is smart enough to not to bring it up to others. Stupid people. He just takes it right up to God. So and so did this. He's a tattletale so-and-so did this. And then he gets the same response. So-and-so has been covered by the judicial imputation of his sins or her sins on the cross. Well, what we do need to study, we still need to get into the minutia of human freedom. But again, let me just continue with the overview. So Satan then, as a result, a lower creation must be made. And this lower creation, again, is not as smart, not as beautiful, not as physically agile as the angels. We are inferior to the angels for a purpose, 
to show Satan that it's not environment, to show Satan that people, with their limited frame of reference, their limited abilities to think, they will be able to make a choice for or against God. They will be able to make a choice as to whether to believe in Christ, and they will be able to make a choice as to whether to execute the protocol plan of God, and they will do so and make that choice, while others will not make that choice, and the issue is choice, 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 volition, volition, volition. And that will blow out of the water Satan's counter that so-and-so didn't make it because of their environment and there will be many examples and many witnesses who can get up, many witnesses who were abused as children, witnesses who grew up under a vicious system of slavery, many witnesses who grew up under a satanic system of religion in which there was child sacrifice, human sacrifice, orgies and the like. And they will stand up and receive their rewards because they executed the protocol plan of God in spite of whatever environment they grew up in. That will shut Satan's case because God will say, you started out in perfect environment and failed. These people started out in an imperfect environment. In fact, horrible environment, and they succeeded. Your argument doesn't hold water. And it doesn't. But Satan's always focused on environment. And that's why it is so important for us to understand that Satan uses systems to try to create and emulate the environment of the millennium of perfect environment. And that would be through some socialist system. And right now our country's in real trouble because we're functioning under Satan's plan and we're no longer acting as a client nation except in very small pockets. So then Adam and Eve made their choice and they chose against. And then we have the fact that God gave Adam and Eve freedom. And then he gives all of us freedom and he has the attitude of live and let live he allows us freedom even though people may not and from this God knew all of this would happen in eternity past and he knew that by granting freedom to Satan he would make a stupid choice and he knew that by granting freedom to Adam and Eve they would make stupid choices and he knew that by adding freedom to the billions and billions and billions and billions of people who have come to follow, most of them would make bad choice regarding eternal life, and a huge majority would make a bad choice with regard to the spiritual life that he has left for us, especially in this church age. And in spite of all that, and in spite of knowing that because man would fall too, that Jesus Christ himself, God, who created the angels, created the universe, created the earth, while he was creating these things, he knew from his omniscience at the time that he would have to go to the cross and suffer unbelievable pain in order to solve this prehistoric angelic conflict. Now you tell me freedom's not important. If Christ thought it so important to go to the cross for it, and then to shout later on, or actually during his ministry on the earth, he would say, your freedom is with me. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And then later on in the scriptures it would say, it is by freedom, and for freedom's sake, that we have been made free. That's the true concept of freedom. And we can understand that by the fact that soldiers go off and die as a substitute for us in order for us to retain freedom. That is, if we're properly going through the function of national defense. 
that is self-defense. What we're doing now is insane, not related to self-defense. And when any nation gets involved in something not related to self-defense, it becomes something that's punishable by God and something that could easily spark a wider war. Not that it will, but it definitely could. And the chances are high based on the history of these things. We almost went to war with both China and Russia in the 1990s when we went into Kosovo. You wouldn't know that, but it's a fact. And going into Kosovo had nothing to do with our national defense. It was another civil war. One thing you don't do is get involved in another country's civil war. Vietnam was different because the communists were infiltrating and we could have won that war and that was self-defense because we were functioning under the idea and the doctrine which was a true doctrine that Russia was out for world conquest and that would just be one of their conquests and then it would flow over and the liberals laughed and said it did not flow over yes it did it flew over into Cambodia and Laos it spread And so we are up the creek with regard to our thinking. But we have freedom to think that way, and operate in such a stupid manner. And Jesus Christ, again, don't forget the whole point of the series. Jesus Christ loved freedom so much that he died on the cross as a substitute for us so that we might have freedom and thus recognize why the worst of sins are listed as gossip, maligning, judging, murder, conspiracies, not to, and one of them in particular, not committing perjury. Why? Because a courtroom is a court of law in which you're dealing with another human being's freedom. If you commit perjury, you might deny that person a freedom they would otherwise have because you lied about them out of malice. But we don't even follow our perjury laws anymore, which is a shame. People have been caught in perjury right there in the courtroom and nothing's done. They already have their system. They already know how they're going to rule. Well, we will continue and get back into the minutia of human freedom tomorrow night. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and opportunity of studying these things. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us to what we've noted and challenge us. And now unto him who is able to keep us from falling, and to present us faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forevermore. Amen.